Welcome to the White Spring Bunker. These halls were built to safeguard some of the most prestigious members of the United States government. We are MODIS, and we are always looking for men and women capable of helping us restore what has been lost. In return, we offer this, a new enclave and our refuge from the world above. Please, take your time and look around. The Colonel has made great strides restoring this place to its former glory. Welcome, member, to our little enclave. Welcome back, members. As always, I am the Operative, your designated tour guide and host here at the White Spring. The storm clouds of war have burst forth upon the denizens of Appalachia, and no one is safe. At Ament Mountain, a desperate defense is waged against an overwhelming force, while at Foundation, an even more insidious plan is put into motion. Deep inside her lab, Major Lilith finds herself hunted, but who is the predator, and who is the prey? Day and the Overseer make final preparations to break into Vault 79, unaware of the greater dangers facing the region, and the Colonel races against time as she leads a rescue force into the mountains of the Savage Divide. Not all is well at the White Spring, as Major Stein returns, discovering that Modus has plans of his own for the future of Appalachia, and Trader Red finds herself in the deepest depths of the mire, perhaps only steps away from her destiny. Kill! 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 Lieutenant, we've got more super mutants coming over the North Wall. Shit! Tell Tyson, get his team moving. You're the boss, Lieutenant. Corporal Samantha ran out of the concrete bunker turned makeshift command post, while Lieutenant Jones scribbled on his hand-drawn map of their defenses. He flinched as a corkscrewing rocket impacted on the roof of the structure, shaking the building and sending streams of dust and debris down on the table. God damn it! The sound of heavy gunfire rose above the roar of more incoming rockets, then a loud series of explosions rocked the whole area. Crap! What the hell was that? Jones ran to the door and looked out at what used to be the Emmett Mountain disposal site. Now it looked more like a war zone, with collapsed corrugated buildings and fires dotting the landscape. To the north, Jones could see multiple columns of smoke rising from the perimeter, and small pieces of debris landing on the ground around him. He reached down to pick one up, and realized he was holding three severed fingers from a super mutant. Ugh! Gross! Jones dropped the fingers and saw other, larger pieces of dead super mutants scattered around. He caught sight of Sergeant Tyson, jogging back towards him, and smiling. What the hell was that, Sergeant? Well, LT, like they used to say back in the day, improvise, adapt, and overcome. Borrowed a few of those toxic waste barrels from Marion's stash. Turns out they make pretty great explosives. Great! Toxic waste, huh? You at least made sure the wind was blowing away from us, right? Sure did. But then again, didn't have much of a choice either way. LT, I don't know how long we can hold. I know, I know. The Colonel is coming. We just need to hold out until she gets here. And when exactly is that, LT? Before we lost comms, she said maybe five, six hours. Damn mutants attacked her, too. Seems like they were trying to delay her as long as possible. Smart. Too smart. Probably the same way they figured out how to jam our radios. But she's bringing everything but the kitchen sink. Just a few more hours, that's all we need. Great, alright. I'll run a perimeter check again. I'm sure they'll come and hit us again soon. Tyson saluted and ran back through the smoke to inspect their defenses. Jones wiped his brow and walked over to get some water. He passed their makeshift medical station. Eugenie, the ghoul trader, was bent over a cot applying a fresh dressing to one of the wounded. She looked up and gave Jones a quick wave before moving on to the next patient. Eugenie had insisted she wanted to be on the firing line. It didn't feel right to hang back when they needed every gun they could muster, but Jones took her aside and explained, in no uncertain terms, that Valeri would probably skin him alive if anything happened to her. It hadn't been an easy conversation, but Eugenie had finally relented and put her skills to use getting their people patched up and back into the fight as best as she could. Jones, you planning on leaving anything left standing? When this is all over, I still got a business to run, you know. Marion Copeland was sitting on an empty waste drum, polishing off a can of cram. 
Marion, I wasn't the one who gave Tyson the ingredients for his bombs, so don't blame me. <laughs> At first, Jones thought Marion was going to be a problem. The Colonel put Jones in charge, and whether Marion liked it or not, Jones wasn't going to let the super mutants just roll over them. Fortunately, along with being a shrewd businesswoman, Marion was also a hell of a fighter. She and her crew made up the bulk of the defense, and Marion made sure that each and every one of them knew what was at stake. Of course, if it had only been them, Jones would have given them about a one chance in a hundred of survival. Fortunately, they received what could be loosely defined as reinforcements right on the heels of the super mutant scouts. Three other caravans had been attacked by the super mutants, escaping only by the skin of their Brahmin, arriving at Edmund Mountain for safety, along with families from a half a dozen local settlements, carrying whatever they could, or sometimes arriving with nothing more than the clothes on their backs. I remember reading about the Alamo in those old history books in the vault. I never imagined I would be living it. Before communications had been cut, Jones had relayed their situation to the Colonel. Now that there were even more lives at risk, the Colonel had said that she'd try to pick up the pace. Jones imagined she'd move heaven and earth if she could, but not even the Colonel could fly. While Jones had even more people to protect, including children, the newcomers hadn't arrived empty-handed. Two of the three caravans had been carrying weapons and ammunition for Crater. It hadn't taken much convincing for the traders to donate their cargoes to the cause. They'd even been able to give a gun to everyone who could hold one, and they had plenty of ammunition, although given the resiliency of the super mutants, even that might not be enough. However, they now also had four 50 caliber heavy machine guns. Jones hadn't deployed them yet, deciding to keep them in reserve. The super mutants hadn't attacked in large numbers yet, and he figured it was better to wait, to pull a surprise of his own for a change. They're good, Charlie. Special greens, just like I promised. Never thought I'd see the day. And then there was Graham. Ever since Jones had first met the super mutant trader, he couldn't figure out why or how he was any different than the other super mutants. He was, in Jones' own words, a really nice guy. There hadn't been time for any long backstories or in-depth conversations. From what Jones could gleam, Graham just wanted to trade. And because of this, he was dedicated to helping the humans of Appalachia. Because as Graham had said, No humans, no trade. That bad business. So Graham had joined their defense. He didn't carry a gun, but he swung an enormous metal club with what looked like a spike cooking pot on the end. Well, it might have looked a bit ridiculous, when the first packs of mutant towns had hit them, Graham had rushed to the front, crushing the mutant dogs one after the other with his tenderizer, as he called it. When he wasn't helping defend the walls, Graham always made time to check on his Brahmin, feeding and talking to her. It was one of the strangest things Jones had ever seen, and spending three years in Appalachia, that was saying something. But he was half damn glad to have Graham on their side. Graham! You doing okay, buddy? Ah, uh, Jones. Me fine. Charlie hungry. But me ready. Big fight. But want to get back to trade, too. Good to hear, Graham. And I hear you. I just want to go home, too. Home where heart is. Or over hill and far away. Heard that long time ago. You're not wrong, Graham. Not wrong at all. Maybe there was just a little bit left of the person that Graham used to be in that big green body somewhere. Jones walked over to the bunker house in the radio room. He wanted to see if they had been able to make contact with anyone else. Polly, anything on the radio? Nada. Zero. Zilch. Uh, nothing but static. Like something is pumping out nothing but white noise across the entire frickin' spectrum. Anything else we can try? Thought you stuffed shirts had all the answers to all our problems. This stuffed shirt is the only thing standing between you and being a super mutant dinner. Yeah, yeah. Whatever you say. We had a good thing going here before you showed up. Jones wasn't here to start an argument. He needed to reestablish radio contact with either the colonel or the bunker, by any means necessary. Listen, Polly. Help is on the way, but it would be better if I could talk to them. And we have access to some pretty serious firepower. I am the sky type stuff, but we need to tell them what to aim at. And <sighs> it's all about the wisecrack, and I get it. We're all on the edge in hell. We're scavengers, not fighters. Just rack that brain of yours. Anything you can think of to get a signal through. There's plenty of equipment here, and maybe with some luck, we can make something work. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Outside the box time. Let me try a few things. 
I'll let you know as soon as I figure something out. Jones put his hand on Polly's shoulder and nodded. The door to the bunker opened and Samantha stuck her head in. Lieutenant, we need you back at command. Looks like the Greenies are massing for a big attack. Shit, shit, shit! All right, be right there, Corporal. Jones had a few final words with Polly before following Samantha back out into the courtyard. The contrails of rockets crisscrossed the sky, their warheads impacting this way and that, and Jones got a sense that they weren't being aimed, but they were being used more to annoy them, with any actual damage more incidental. The two hurried back to their makeshift command bunker, where Jones found Tyson, Marion, and Samuel, the provisional leader of the settler groups, under their protection. Doesn't look good, LT. Won't lie, Jones. My folks are scared. We put the old folks and the kids down on the disposal site, but if we lose the courtyard, there ain't no way they can escape. Then we don't. My crew ain't running. No one is running. The mutants would cut us down in the open anyway. The colonel will be here in a few hours. We just have to hold until then. And if she's late? She won't be. If nothing else, you stuffed shirts are quite the optimists. <sighs> We're putting our lives in your hands, so what's the plan? Jones pulled out the rough map of Emmett Mountain they've been using to put together their defenses. I agree with the sergeant. They've been looking for weaknesses, and I believe they think they have a good idea of what they're dealing with. They hit the east wall pretty hard today. So they'll attack there now? No. If these were regular super mutants, you'd be right. I'm sure they want us to think that, given how hard they pressed. Sergeant? Yes, LT? You have a better feel for these greenies than anyone. Where are they going to hit us? South. Why south? First, the last real intel we had was that three main groups were converging on us. One from the Isolator Gray, another from West Tech, and the last from Huntersville. I can bet you my bottom dollar that the ones hitting us right now are the ones from West Tech. They're the closest and are already on our heels, probably trying to wear us down until the rest show up. They've been doing a damn fine job. I got five dead already. Not to mention another dozen wounded. Why wouldn't they just keep coming the same way? They had to make it look good, and they did. Hell, if I didn't know it any better, I'd say they'd come right up over top of us again. But I do know better. Had this slippery economy up in Alaska trick our guys more than a few times. Put on a good show while he moved his troops up and down to attack another part of the line. This feels exactly the same. So you're betting our lives on your intuition? My gut. And I trust my gut further than I could throw one of those abominations out there. That's it? Your gut? That, and because it's what I would do if I was in their shoes. Good enough for me, Sergeant. Samuel, Marion, get half of your people and move them to the south wall. Sergeant, get those 50 cals ready. I have a feeling we're going to need them. Sure thing, LT. I'll send word. All right then, I'll get my people moving. The howl of super mutant hounds interrupted the group, followed by the explosion of multiple rocket impacts. Mutants, lots of them, coming up from the south. Crap, get moving! Jones watched the group break into a dead run back outside. He grabbed Tyson by the shoulder before he left. Sergeant, kick them in the teeth. We have to set them back on their heels. Get them to rethink their plans. We need to buy time. Understand? Tyson just smiled. LT. War. War never changes. Jones watched him go. Tyson never did seem fit for being in the vault. Perhaps this is what he was really meant for. Outside, the super mutants charged forward from their positions. It had taken them hours to mass their forces but everything was going according to plan. The warlords had consolidated all the warbands and were going to roll over this puny human settlement. The others had all been easy and the small pink humans had run away. These didn't and that made the warlords happy. So much easier to kill humans when they were standing still. They had been told, though none of them really remembered who told them or how, that more humans were coming. The warlords from the big dish had sent war parties to delay them. But in the end, everything was going according to plan. Dozens of mutant hounds led the charge. They would act as a distraction to let the others get closer. Suiciders, each carrying a mini nuke, would follow close behind to destroy the walls and get in amongst the defenders. Further back, ranks of super mutants with assault rifles and rocket launchers would provide covering fire. 
while those with miniguns would deal with any difficult pockets of resistance. All told, it was a frightening display of might, enough to make all of Appalachia quake as they stormed forward. Tyson worked quickly as he could, getting everyone in position, while Marion and Samuel brought up reinforcements from the rear. The sergeant saw the force erased against him and felt like he was back in Alaska again. There would be no retreat, nowhere to go this time. There was no time for encouraging words or an inspiring speech. This was about survival, plain and simple. Settlers, caravan guards, scavengers, arrayed against an army of monsters. Behind makeshift concrete barricades, scrap metal, and broken vehicles, each and every defender sighted down their weapons and fired. The barrage tore holes through the ranks of the mutant house, flipping some end over end as their momentum still carried their bodies forward. The first massive explosions rocked the landscape. Stray bullets hit the suiciders' mini nukes. Large chunks of debris, including rocks and pieces of supermoon, rained down on Emmett Mountain. Rockets filled the air as more supermoons emerged from the trees, while the sound of miniguns erupted as bullets tore into the barricades. Keep firing. Get those 50s ready. A few of the mutant hounds got close, too close, and the shifting of fire gave the remaining suiciders time to get within range of the barricades. Get down! Multiple small tactical nuclear blasts rocked the area as the suiciders used rocks, hammers, or even just smashed the mini mutes onto the ground to set them off. Several defenders were vaporized, and many barricades were blown over or heavily damaged. It was a signal for the second wave of super mutants to charge, following close behind carrying rocket-powered sledgehammers called super sledges, or all variety of other weapons firing as they ran. For Tyson, it was Anchorage all over again. The waves of communist troops threw themselves on the American positions until their bodies were stacked five or six high in front of them. Only now, it was eight-foot-tall monsters shaking the ground as they ran, seemingly shrugging off their bullets and lasers. Every super mutant which fell seemed to be replaced by two more, getting closer and closer, and the defenders were taking their own losses. Tyson watched as two scavengers and three settlers were hit, before being pulled to safety by their makeshift medical team. Glancing over his shoulder, the sergeant confirmed his surprise was in place. Then he yelled over to the others. Pull back! Now! They hadn't had time to rehearse the maneuver, but as a group, the men and women manning the walls fired one last burst at the charging super mutants before ducking and running backwards to their secondary positions. The victorious roars of the super mutants could be heard above the explosions, rockets, and gunfire as they saw the humans flee. Once they were inside the walls, they would kill each and every one of the humans and feast on their bones. Jones watched through his binoculars. For a bunch of amateurs, Marion's crew and the settlers pulled back without panicking. Lieutenant winced as he saw more of them get shot on the way, and one group blown apart by an errant rocket. He turned his attention back to the wall, and within moments the first super mutants reached the top, firing into the courtyard, soon to be joined by what looked like dozens more of them. Looking to his right, Jones saw Tyson reach the second line, and he keyed his pit boy. Open fire! The canvas coverings were torn away from there, ace in the hole, and as one, four 50 caliber heavy machine guns lined up and fired on the surprise super mutants. The ripping sound drowned out everything else as the gunners kept their triggers down, slicing through the mutants, blowing off arms, legs, and heads. Sergeant Tyson raised his rifle, and he and the rest of the defenders added their fire to the fray, but the super mutants continued to charge through the inferno, heedless of losses, leaving a trail of bodies in their wake, returning fire even as they died by the dozen. A few late arriving suiciders added to the carnage, blowing enormous holes in the walls, allowing more super mutants to advance from both the right and left. Corporal Samantha, in command of her own fire team, tried to contain the super mutants pouring into the compound from a large opening, only to watch two of her men nearly chopped in half by a minigun. Just as it looked like they would be overrun, a voice boomed behind her. Swinging his tenderizer, the super mutant trader nearly decapitated one mutant while crushing another on the backswing. Samantha leapt forward to help, firing from the hip when she was back to back with Graham each taking their own target, drenched in greenish blood. The 50 cals ate up ammo by the second, and Jones was afraid they'd run out of bullets before they ran out of super mutants to kill. Fire and smoke blanketed the area, with the fighting line defined by what appeared to be rivers of fire, stabbing out towards each other. More rockets traveled overhead, landing on one of the heavy machine guns, destroying it and killing the crew. Jones swore and grabbed his rifle. Just as he was about to run towards the fighting, the cacophony of sound was suddenly silenced replacing with the cackling of fires and the occasional burst of rifle fire, even as the rockets no longer screeched overhead. He couldn't see much through the smoke and haze, but he caught sight of Sergeant Tyson, nursing a shoulder wound, walking back out of the smoke. Sergeant, you okay? Just a flesh wound, LT. I think we stopped him. 
A wind blew down from the mountains around them, and as the smoke was blown away, the scene revealed itself. Dozens of super mutant corpses littered the ground, their green blood leaching onto the ground in giant pools. Their bodies were stacked two and three high in places, all the way back to the wall and beyond. By ones and twos, the defenders stood up to survey the landscape and make sure they themselves were still alive. The barrels of the heavy machine guns still glowed red and smoke from use, the ground covered in spent shell casing. Eugenie and the rest of the medical team went from position to position checking to see who was wounded, helping a few limp back to the medical tent, while the others helped move the dead. Hey LT, can I borrow those binoculars real quick? Sure, Sergeant. Jones handed the binocular to Tyson, who threaded his way through the bodies of the dead super mutants and climbed up on top of the undamaged portion of the wall. The field in front was also covered in bodies and the craters from exploding suiciders, and he raised the binoculars to scan the far tree line. Yet. Tyson found himself staring at another super mutant. This one was watching him through his own set of binoculars. There was a group of them, watching him. The one by the binoculars lowered them and seemingly smiled before turning and saying something to the others. There were noddings of the heads and they all turned around and disappeared into the trees. Tyson heard someone coming up from behind. What did you see, Sergeant? They'll be back, LT. They know about the 50s now. We're gonna need a new damn plan. Figured. How long do you think we have? We kicked them in the teeth. It depends on how long they come up with their own plan now. Get everyone you can back on the line and tell them to keep a sharp eye out. They get back to the command post. We need to talk to Samuel and Marion. Sure thing, LT. Jones watched the sergeant quickly reorganize their remaining people. They still hadn't been able to make contact with the colonel, and they had no idea when she'd arrive with the relief force. We have to hold. Just for a while longer. The colonel will be here. I know she will. As Jones started to formulate a new plan in his head, he could already hear the distant sound of the mutant hounds. Once upon a time, 27 years after the bombs fell, there were two people, a vault dweller and a California girl. They met and sparks flew. That's when things got interesting. Once upon a wasteland is their story. Follow Elizabeth Kirby and Odessa Valdez as they pursue their happily ever after in the post-apocalyptic Appalachian wasteland of Fallout 76. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and many other podcasting platforms. Once Upon a Wasteland, a Fallout 76 love story. Available now. The basement of AVR Medical was bathed in an inky blackness. A few emergency lights cast a very pale glow which barely illuminated the immediate surroundings. The walls, floors, and ceilings were lined with large cracks, as if the entire building had shifted on its foundation. In one of the large storage rooms, a huge hole had been ripped in the floor, revealing an enormous machine topped with a massive drill. Along one side, a split appeared, revealing a large hatch that slowly pivoted open. Out of the dark interior, several black-clad figures dropped to the floor, carrying a variety of weapons, scanning the interior of the room. Location confirmed. Area clear. Team 1, you're on data retrieval duty. Collect any and all samples. Alive if possible, dead if necessary. Team 2, locate and contain the primary target. We're under orders to take her alive. Yes, sir. Never come across anyone else. Terminate with extreme prejudice. The figures disappeared into the swirling clouds of dust and debris, with only the echo of their boots resounding through the broken hallways. Oh! How rude. Getting interrupted right in the middle of my work and all. Lilith picked herself up off the laboratory floor and brushed off her lab coat as she surveyed the room with only the illumination of a few old emergency lights. Large cracks ran along the floor and up the walls to the ceiling, revealing that the whole structure may have been compromised. Since when does Charleston have earthquakes? Since never. That'd be my guess. 
the lab cages were mostly intact, though at least a few of the animals were either dead or unconscious. There was a hollow boom from down the hall, followed by another, then another. Looks like McDonald is alive. And awake, too. Lilith went over to the various terminals and confirmed that none of them still had power. Such a shame, too. Finding a manufactured FEV variant in Appalachia today? And one with a dormant substrain? It sounds like up my old dear dad's alley. Eh, if he wasn't dead, that is. Lilith's mind was running a mile a minute, trying to process what she'd found before. Well, and whatever just happened. She smiled as she remembered that all of her data was automatically written to back up holotapes on the terminals downstairs. Lilla snapped her head up as she heard the unmistakable sound of gunfire coming from upstairs. It couldn't have been Malgus, since he disdained the use of ballistic weapons in favor of his Gatling plasma and holy board. This meant someone else was here. Uninvited guests? That makes me angry. Very angry. Reaching under the table, Lilith grabbed a 10 mm pistol and a long serrated knife. It was her personal favorite, carved from a claw she took as a souvenir from the Scorch Beast Queen. She was going to head down to get the data first, then find Malgus and the girls. Along the way, if she ran into any interlopers, well, then it would be time to have some fun. Lilith crouched and made her way over to the cages, opening up each and every one of them. The various creatures hissed or barked, but kept their attention focused on Lilith herself. Okay, you wonderful little critters. Mommy needs you to go cause some trouble. Can you do that? Almost as one, the creatures darted past Lilith and out of the lab down the various corridors. Let's see how they deal with them. There was more gunfire above, measured and methodical. Doesn't sound like raiders. How interesting. Brandishing her knife and pistol, Lilith jogged through the surgery amphitheater and down a flight of stairs to the backup server room. Her enhanced FEV senses allowed her to see pretty well in the dark, something she never really bothered to mention to the others. Not even Val. But then again, a girl needed to keep a few secrets, didn't she? Lilith could hear the sounds from boots above, followed by the howls of her creatures and more gunfire. Whoever you are, you've picked the wrong laboratory to break into. Opening the server room door, Lilith smiled when she saw that they were still running on local backup power. She would grab all the tapes and get them somewhere safe, and then finish what she started. As she started pulling the tapes from the drive, she was so distracted that she missed the footfalls behind her. Hold it right there. Step away from the terminal. Lilla slowly put her hands up. Her knife and pistol lay on the table behind her, just out of reach, and she turned around slowly. Well, well, well. What do we have here? Lilith was faced with a soldier of some sort, wearing sleek black armor, black mask, and an assault rifle pointed at her head. Lead. I have the primary target in what looks like the data. Downstairs. Server room. We're on our way. You do realize what a big mistake you're making, right? Don't move and slide those tapes over to me. But you said don't move, didn't you? How am I supposed to slide you anything? Just slide the tapes over. If you try anything, I will kill you. Kill me? You haven't even gotten to know me yet. You never know. You might like me. Lilith could tell the soldier was getting annoyed with her, and she had no intention of handing over what was rightfully hers. All it would take was a moment of hesitation. Last chance. Good. I'm getting bored anyway. Taking the chance, Lilith moved, lunging for the knife with one swift motion and then whirling to her opponent. His reflexes were quick quicker than she anticipated, and his finger pulled the trigger even as Lilith was almost on top of him. Lilith's knife slid in between the seams of his armor, cutting into the flesh, and they both fell to the ground with Lilith on top. She twisted the knife and pulled it out before plunging him to the man's neck, severing the carotid artery. Blood poured from the wound as the man bled out, vainly trying to grab onto Lilith before his hands fell back to his side, and he was still. Didn't I say you made a horrible mistake? Ah, ow! Oh, damn. Lilith became aware of a pain in her side. When she put her hand there, it came away covered in blood. Her blood. She had been shot, not once, but at least twice. Great. Just great. Now look what you did. In a huff, Lilith got up and almost stumbled. In a rage now, she kicked the dead man over and over before calming down long enough to grab a medkit. 
Opening it, she picked up the stim pack and tossed it over her shoulder. One other little secret she never bothered to mention was that she was allergic to stim packs. The very medical miracle which could have easily dealt with her wounds would either have made her very sick or perhaps even kill her. The universe's own little joke, I guess. Instead, she tried to dress the wounds as best she could, stuffing them with gauze and wrapping a bandage around her waist. Wincing, she did inject herself with a dose of medics to dull the pain before collecting the rest of the backup holotapes and stuffing them into her pack, grabbing her pistol and knife and going to leave. Of course, she couldn't help herself, and she kicked the dead body one more time before limping towards the door. Lilith's reflexes saved her as bullets chewed through the doorframe and smashed into the terminals along the wall. Holding her side, Lilith glanced around the corner and could see three more soldiers, each wearing the identical armor, advancing down the corridor with assault rifles. <coughs> well, at least I'm not bored anymore. <coughs> Harold! Malgus's roar reverberated as he waded into the black-armored soldier, swinging his board above his head and smashing it down on the first before slamming the second to the wall with his bald power-armor fist. The third turned and fired, emptying an entire magazine at the big man, only to have every bullet bounce off. Swinging the board again, Malgus nearly decapitated the last soldier, leaving him a broken ragdoll on the floor. Harold, we are invaded by heathens! Lilith winced and smiled as Malgus strode into the room. The big man rushed to Lilith's side when he saw the blood. You are hurt. I will attend to thee. Good old Malgus. I'll be fine. Just a flesh wound of sorts. Where are the girls? The hounds are safe. I was letting them play when the building began to quake. Why, Malgus? You old softy, you. They required scratches behind the ears. Lilith just smiled and leaned on Malgus. How many more of them are there? I do not know. I killed two more upstairs. However, I fear there are many more. Hmm. Ah, ah. No, no, it's okay. The lab has a back set of stairs up to the main level, and I have an idea. Of course, Harold. Let me help you. Malgus wrapped another bandage around Lilith's wounds before taking her arm and leading her back down the hallway, past the bodies. Hold on a second. Lilith stopped by one of the dead soldiers and leaned down. Examining the body, she couldn't find anything on the armor or black underarmor that identified the man or where he was from, and the pip boy each one of them was wearing was of a design she'd never seen before. However, this particular dead man had a tattoo on his neck. Lilith recognized it from the old history books in Vault 76. It was the insignia of the United States Marine Corps. Harold, I hear more heathens. We must go. Another little clue. Very interesting. Malgus helped Lilith back through the surgery area into her lab. Despite her wounds and blood loss, she kept her pistol forward and the two of them scanned the area for any signs of the invaders. Once in the lab, Lilith cursed. Fuckity fuck fuck fuck. They stole all my research. Sure enough, the lab had been cleaned out. The filing cabinets containing her journals and notes were all empty, along with the stacks of holotapes she'd made based on all of her experiments over the past month. Lilla stomped her foot in anger, then nearly fell over, only to be caught by Malgus. Harold, you are too weak. We must leave. Lilla fumed, but knew that Malgus was right. As much as she hated to admit it, she was more badly wounded than she first realized. Despite her near super mutant constitution and natural healing factor, she had lost a lot of blood and maybe injured an internal organ or two. Lilla threw her arm over Malgus's armor and pointed towards the far door. Malgus spun just as more gunfire erupted from the other side of the room. In the gloom, Lilith could barely make out several more figures firing automatic weapons. Harold, get to the door! I will shield you! Malgus pushed Lilith towards the door, keeping himself between her and those shooting at them. Lilith half ran, half stumbled, firing her pistol back towards the other with Malgus close behind. Once through the door, Malgus managed to close it behind them before grabbing a filing cabinet and bracing it against the door. I don't think that's going to hold them for long, big guy. You must escape. Lilith looked at the door, then around the room they found themselves in. Then she heard the hollow boom again. Hold on a sec, Malgus. I have an idea. Lilith hobbled over to the other end of the room, even as the door suddenly bulged inward as whoever was on the other side tried to force their way in. Lilith walked up to the plexiglass cage, a spiderweb of cracks marking where heavy blows had struck it. She placed her face against the glass and spoke. 
Hey, McDonald. You want to get out of there? I have a job for you. The huge figure rose up, whatever it had for a head nearly touching the ceiling, while various tentacles waved in the air. Alrighty then. Just don't be boring. Malgus, get ready. Many things happened all at once. The door exploded outward just as Lilith raised her pistol and shot the reinforced glass at a precisely calculated angle, causing it to shatter. Malgus was already moving towards the other door as Lilith did the same, even as the black-clad figures rushed into the room and pointed their weapons. Lilith had just enough time to look over her shoulder to see the thing that had been Private McDonald burst out of its cage and head directly towards the invaders. As all of the fire was then directed at the charging monster, Lilith and Malgus were able to make their escape to the back stairs, with Malgus sweeping Lilith up in his arms to run faster, carrying them both to safety. On the ground floor, they could still hear the roar, followed by screams. Good boy, McDonald. Definitely not boring. Malgus scanned the lobby of AVR Medical. The whole floor was silent, broken only by the sounds from downstairs. Harold. We are safe. Lilith winced again, but still managed a crooked smile before limping over to the front door, opening it. The two mutant hounds, waiting patiently outside, saw Lilith and howled before bounding over, almost knocking her to the ground. Oh, what good girls you are! You'll get some special treats, I promise. We must leave, Harold. You require medical attention. Lilith was about to respond when she saw movement over Malgus's shoulder. Someone had managed to follow them up the stairs. Magus must have seen the look in Lilith's eyes, because he turned around just as the figure raised their rifle and fired. The big man caught the entire magazine to the front of his armor, <gasps> with a single bullet catching him in the neck, knocking him backwards. Malgus, no! Lilith raised her own pistol and fired over and over, walking forward as she zeroed in. Whether she was lucky or just that skilled, the dark-clad figure toppled over. Lilith ran up as she reloaded before standing over the body and emptying the magazine once again. Uh, Harold! Lilith turned and ran back to Malgus. The bullet had cut through his neck and blood poured from the wound. Malgus, it'll be okay. I just need to stop the bleeding. Don't move. It's too late for me, Harold. I go to the old gods now. Thank you for leading me to my vengeance. Malgus's lifeblood drained through Lilith's hands as she couldn't stop the bleeding. She watched the light disappear from his eyes as his head rolled to the side. His face, which had been in perpetual scowl since she'd first met him, finally looked at peace. Clearing away some of the blood, Lilith took the totem necklace he usually wore and discovered something on the back. Slipped inside a small leather pouch was an old, worn photograph. Unfolding it, Lilith saw a young woman standing next to a small boy. The woman sported a black eye, but she still smiled as she had her arms around who Lilith assumed was her son. She looked at the photo, then back to Malgus. The resemblance was obvious, and perhaps she never really knew the big man at all. Lilith took the photo and slipped it into her own pouch. The building started shaking again, with plaster and concrete falling from the ceilings and large cracks snaking up the walls. Lilith was too weak to move Malgus's body. She had to limp back outside, where two mutant hounds waited, barking at the crumbling building. As she clutched the pack of backup tapes, Lilith felt the earth shift and AVR Medical collapsed into itself, leaving a giant pile of rubble. Through the earth beneath her feet, she could sense a vibration, like something big was moving underground, before dissipating to nothing. Looking at the collapsed rubble, Lilith was filled with rage. Raising her hand against her side, she motioned to her hounds before turning and limping back to the north. I don't know who you are, or what you want, but when I find you, you're going to wish you picked a fight with someone easier. Like God. A series of tents surrounded by several Brahmin in suits of power armor under the watchful eyes of new enclave soldiers stood on the dusty road just south of the Middle Mountain cabins. 
Colonel Valeria stood in her command tent, fuming as she received status reports from her provisional second-in-command, Captain Robertson, formerly in charge of Team Beta. We've got five wounded and three dead, Colonel. The last super mutant ambush also damaged two suits of power armor. The tech thinks they can get it repaired, but it's going to take time. Time we don't have, Captain. We're already behind schedule. Ma'am, everyone here understands what's at stake, but no one wants to be running headlong into another ambush. If we don't clear the road, we'll be fighting our way back out again. Only this time escorting a bunch of civilians, too. Valeria took off her beret and ran her fingers through her hair. She knew Robertson was right, and even the words of her father echoed in her ears. Proper planning and preparation prevents piss-poor performance. It wouldn't do anyone any good to rush off and get more of her people killed. Valeria looked down at her Pip-Boy, then back up to the captain. All right. Thirty minutes, Captain. Inform Team Omicron they'll take the lead. Once we've reached Emmett Mountain, our first priority will be to secure the site and start evacuating the civilians. Team Theta will cover the rear and Beta will escort the civilians back here before we all rendezvous for transit back to the White Spring. Understood? Yes, ma'am. And Captain, any updates from MODIS? No, ma'am. We received the last COVAC download about an hour ago. But the closer we get to Emmett Mountain, the worse the radio interference becomes. There goes our orbital support. What was that, ma'am? Nothing, Captain. Send an operative down the mountain and see if they can act as a relay for our messages back to the bunker. I want updated intelligence before we leave, if possible. Of course, Colonel. Valeria watched Robertson leave and sighed. Walking out onto the road, she looked to the south and could see black columns of smoke rising in the distance. They were still too far away to hear the explosions and gunfire, but in her mind, she could picture the chaos. Worst, Valeria felt it in the pit of her stomach. For the first time, Valeria was truly afraid. In the past, in the face of extreme threats like the Wendigo Night Stalker or the Scorch Beast Queen, she had felt some fear, but it was a physical thing, a stress response, a natural reaction to facing unspeakable horror. But now she had to face something else, losing another person she loved, and that was somehow far worse. Better and Sullivan were nearby, cleaning their weapons. Uh, ain't this some shit? Almost makes you want to go back working with Lilith again, doesn't it? I don't know if I'd say that, but these super mutants are nothing to sneeze at. How the hell did they get so smart? Beats the hell out of me. Used to think they couldn't find their ass with both hands. But those traps they built? I don't even know if I could be able to think those up. Valeria walked over and stood above the two operatives. We're moving out in half an hour. Theta is going to be in the lead, but I need you two on point. Why us? Because I believe you can spot any ambushes long before we stumble into them. You have a certain survival instinct we can use. Thanks, I think. Just get ready to move out. I need you ahead of Theta. No idea if our radios are going to work for much longer, so don't get out of range or do anything stupid. Yes, Colonel. Sure thing. The Colonel abruptly turned and went back towards her tent pausing to look south once again, before disappearing inside. Huh. She's spooked. The Colonel? She doesn't get spooked. Don't know what to tell you, Sullivan. Got a sense for these things. Still think you're full of shit, Bitter. But damn. Us two get to lead this little parade? How about we just concentrate on not getting killed? Or eaten? Or both? Sure thing. Anyways, I bet you 50 caps I spot them first. 50? Hell yeah. And no cheating this time. Easy caps, just you wait. Sullivan just laughed and grabbed his rifle, slinging it over his shoulder as the two operatives walked down the road, past the other teams as they made their last preparations for resuming the march to Emmett Mountain. Far above, the eyes of the Kovac kept careful watch. The Colonel had made better progress than expected although it appeared that the super mutants merely intended to delay her advance, not stop it. Modus was intrigued by these recent developments. His calculations required significant adjustments, and his plans would need to be accelerated. However, regardless of the outcome of the colonel's excursion, Modus was confident that the White Spring would remain secure. His assets would ensure continuity. Then there was the matter of the rogue transmission. However, he turned his attention to more pressing matters, as Modus noted Major Stein had returned. The unknown variable required investigation and resolution. Human failings would not be allowed to jeopardize what they'd already accomplished.
I cannot believe Day locked us up. The least he could have done was put us in the same cell. Amanda, this is not funny. Who said I was joking, baby doll? Ugh, we need to get out of here. Can you do anything with the lock? I tried, but they took all my bobby pins. Still not funny. Seriously, baby doll, I would if I could. These foundation twerps might not be raiders, but they do know how to build. These are by far the best cells I've ever had the misfortune to find myself in. Get thrown in jail a lot, Amanda? Now who's being funny? What are we going to do? I have to warn the colonel. The more I think about it, the more I'm sure Shadow was up to no good. I have a really bad feeling about this. Cindy continued her pacing from one side of her cell to the other, all of about six feet. But she felt she needed to do something, anything. Amanda, on the other hand, spent her time examining every inch of their cells, trying to find anything that could be a way out. Unfortunately, as she has said before, the bars were solid and the locks were first rate. Even worse, the guards had been given strict instructions not to get too close, or let them out for any reason, at least until day returned. The guards weren't always in the same room, and Amanda figured they were being watched via the cameras mounted on the ceilings above them. They only came around to bring food and water, and returned to collect the old plastic trays. Ever the raider, Amanda probably could have done something, more direct, but damn if she wasn't going to do anything that might cause Cindy to get hurt. However, they did have to find a way out, and soon. What Cindy had told her about this shadow fellow worried her, and if something bad was going to go on at the White Spring, it had the potential to be really bad for everyone in Appalachia. Above ground, Duplica, known as Sandy the traitor to the folks at Foundation, was leading her Brahmin up the hill towards the main gate. She was surprised by the number of people crowding to get inside, and not just traitors, but regular folks carrying what it looked like most of their worldly possessions on their backs. Ever curious, and since information was her primary currency, Duplica poked the traitor in front of her. Hey, watch it. What do you want? Sorry, just wondering what's going on. You haven't heard? Heard what? Super mutants. A lot of them. Been hitting caravans and settlements up and down the Divide. Heard there's some big dust-up over at Emmett Mountain. People are running scared. Big Foundation is as good a place as any to hole up until things calm down. Sounds bad. Figure we're safe here? Don't rightly know, but better than being out on the road. At least they have walls and turrets here. Anyway, I figure it'll all blow over in a few days. Usually does, anyway. The trader turned back around and pushed his Brahmin forward as a line of people started moving through the gates. Duplica was an excellent judge of people, and what she could see around here was one thing, and one thing only. Fear. Ever the one to take advantage of every situation, Duplica figured the information she got from Rose was now even more valuable. Bet I can get Ward to pay triple, and not even have to find one of those damn osmosis kits for him this time. She'd been surprised when Rose called her over the radio. The two of them had done business in the past, with Duplica providing as many chems as she could get her hands on, with Rose paying with all kinds of juicy information about the comings and goings of the various factions in the region. A couple of times, Rose had even given her the location of old raider caches, as long as Duplica gave her a portion of the profits. It was good business, even if the old raider bot was certifiably insane. This time around, it was information pure and simple. Very valuable information, as it turned out. The raider bot had picked up a transmission from outside Appalachia, and based on the transcript, it meant someone was coming. A number of someones, actually. The military jargon didn't make much sense to Duplica, but she figured it would to Foundation. Come on, folks. Keep it orderly. Plenty of room inside, so no need to panic. Despite the general nervousness of the crowd, they were all able to finally pass through the gate into Foundation proper. Unlike the last time Duplica had been there, just about all the available space was filled with tents, makeshift camps and volunteers going from group to group passing out food and water. Looking up, Duplica could see guards stationed along the walls and more turrets than she had seen before. If she didn't know any better, it looked like Foundation was preparing for war. And honestly, she really didn't know any better. Come on, get these folks settled. I want to get these gates closed. Ward was standing next to his trailer, speaking to several Foundation guards. Duplica figured this was as good a time as any to talk to him. And no, I don't care about those missing bone saws right now. Check the ammunition stocks and start talking to the refugees. We might need to ask them to take up arms with us. If it comes to that. Hey, Ward. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, hey, Sandy. Sorry. A bit busy at the moment. No time to talk. 
It'll only take a minute. I've got some interesting information you might want to hear. If it ain't information on super mutants, or something to help with all these refugees, like I said, I ain't interested. Fine then. Where's Paige? I'm sure he'll want to hear this. Ward reached into his trailer and pulled out an old single-action revolver and holster, buckling around his waist before looking back up to Duplica. Paige ain't here. He's not? Not in the mood to explain. Supposed to be gone a couple of weeks with Jenny, Dr. Hornwright, Day, and the Overseer. You're free to hang around until they get back, or until I have time to talk, but like I said, I got bigger problems. Ward waved her off and grabbed one of the guards by the arm and dragged them off towards the wall. Duplica was left with a lot more questions than answers, and unfortunately, no buyers for what she was selling. However, ever the one to sense opportunity knocking, if she could find out why Paige and the other Foundation leadership decided to go off on a little vacation in the middle of a crisis, including both Day and the Overseer, well, that was information a few other folks would be very interested in. Baby doll, you're gonna wear holes in your shoes if you keep pacing like that. I don't understand how you can be so calm about all of this, Amanda. You'd be surprised. Sometimes just waiting is the best thing you can do. But I need to do something. Hey, did you feel that? Earthquake? The entire cavern started to shake, with rocks and debris falling from the ceiling, while trays clattered to the floor. Amanda and Cindy grabbed the cell bars to keep themselves from falling. As the shaking got worse, the two heard a loud mechanical sound as an explosion of dust and dirt burst upward and down the hallways, obscuring everything. The rumbling subsided. Outside the makeshift foundation brig, workers picked themselves up and found themselves confronted with an enormous drill. Having risen directly out of the ground and standing nearly 30 feet tall, almost touching the ceiling above, one of the workers crept forward and placed their hand on the metal surface. There was a loud alarm that resonated throughout the cavern, forcing them all to cover their ears. Super mutants started pouring from the interior, jumping down and landing on the cavern floor. The Foundation workers didn't stand a chance, either being bludgeoned to death or shot where they stood. Amanda and Cindy ducked as bullets ricocheted down the hallway. Each of them grabbed their cot and flipped them over to provide some measure of cover as they heard the super mutants begin advancing through the workspaces towards them. Human time is done! This is the urge of the super mutant! Cindy tried to remember her training and keep herself calm, but inside she was terrified. They both were trapped in locked cells with no way to escape. She looked at Amanda. Amanda, what's going on? Why is this happening? Baby doll? I don't know. I just don't know. You'll never leave here alive! Hi, everyone. I'm Chris. And I'm not! We're not doing that routine right now. We're trying to do an advertisement. Oh, fine. I'm Sir Aloysius Pernicious, the better half of the team at One Wall Comedy. Okay, I wouldn't go that far. Anyway, come check us out on YouTube. We're your number one source for independent sketch comedy on the internet. Yeah, because that's such a big market. All right, come on. Let's get out of here. I'm getting paid for this, right? Don't push your luck. Sophia and Stein's trek up from Riverside Manor left them both with many unanswered questions. Try as they might, neither could explain the missing time or what might have happened to either of them. However, they now had more pressing concerns. They both had promised the other that they would return to Riverside again and get to the bottom of the mystery there. Modus had been insistent that they both return to the White Spring as soon as possible. When Stein asked why, the AI would merely respond that the current situation required the Major's presence at the bunker. As they traveled north, there seemed to be something in the air, like Appalachia had changed. Caravans which passed them on the road seemed to be in a greater hurry than usual, barely offering an acknowledgement to the travelers before prodding their Brahmin to move faster. 
Stein and Sophia exchanged worried looks as they passed the old wreckage of the traveling carnival, long known as the landmark denoting the final half mile from the White Spring. What do you think is going on, Andrew? I'm not sure, Sophia. But I'm sure the Colonel has everything well in hand. Sophia looked at Stein again. In the time they'd been together, she'd developed strong feelings for the man who had saved her. She reached out and took his hand, and together they walked over the last rise, revealing the grounds of the resort in front of them. Nothing looked out of the ordinary, with new enclave operatives and bunker bots patrolling the grounds and manning the gates. As they approached, Stein was surprised to find members of the operations staff at the checkpoint, instead of the usual guards. Threat analysis, Green. Standing down. Why, hello there, Sergeant Long. Aren't you supposed to be in communications? Uh, yes, sir, but we're short-handed, so Captain Reynolds assigned a lot of us to guard duty. Did you just say Reynolds? Yes, sir. He's in charge right now, since the colonel left. Wait, wait. I don't understand. Where did the colonel go? And who put Reynolds in command? Modus, sir. Sorry, I, I thought you would know what's going on. Sergeant, it's been a long day, so please, humor me. What is it that you know? Sir, the super mutants are on the move. A lot of them. Team Gamma is holed up at the Emma Mountain Disposal Site with a bunch of civilians. The Colonel took Teams Alpha and Beta, along with just about everyone else she could find, and headed up the mountain to relieve them. And Reynolds and Modus? Modus announced that Reynolds would be in charge until the Colonel got back. Though, I assume you'll be in charge now. Damn straight, Sergeant. All right, I need to see what's going on and check in with the Colonel. Obviously, I've been on the loop for far too long. Sergeant Long saluted and returned to his post as both Sophia and Stein passed through the gate onto the grounds. Threat analysis free. Resuming standard patrol pattern. Stein's face was set into a scowl. He'd been distracted, been away for far too long. Being very well aware of Reynolds' past, the idea of him being in charge of anything, other than that little box the colonel had put him in, aided his gut. Worse, if things were so bad that Valeri had stripped the White Spring and headed off to face the super mutants, he should be at her side. It just wasn't right. Andrew, what's going on? I don't know, Sophia, but I plan on getting to the bottom of it. Making a quick decision, Stein turned left and led Sophia up the path towards the resort golf clubhouse, now repurposed as the school and meeting house for the residents of Refugee Row. Why are we going this way? You remember Jennifer? I never did anything about those missing men. She probably wants an update. But you talked to your people about them, right? No. I didn't. I was supposed to. I wanted to. But I didn't. And I don't know why. When they arrived at the clubhouse, class was just letting out for the day. A mix of younger children and teenagers, dressed in a collection of old vault seats, scavenged clothing, and the new school uniforms, piled out into the afternoon sun. A few stopped and said hello to the Major, while the others organized an impromptu game of tag or hide-and-seek among the hedges. Stein gave them all a salute and smiled, before the light disappeared from his face as he turned to stick his head into the makeshift classroom. Jennifer, it's Major Stein. I'm back. Ouch! Stein stepped inside just as a tall, middle-aged woman crawled out from under the desk, rubbing her head. And it was most definitely not Jennifer. Pauline? Is that you? Oh, sorry, Major. I, I dropped my notebook and you, you surprised me. Oh, uh, right. Sorry about that. I'm looking for Jennifer. Pauline suddenly looked nervous and started looking around. She's, uh, not here. In fact, she went to find you. We haven't seen her in a few days. A few other folks are missing, too. Stein took a step forward, and Pauline took a step back. Whoa, wait a sec. I don't know anything about that. I've been on assignment outside of the White Spring. I came here to try and apologize to Jennifer, and now you're telling me that she's gone missing? Major, you've been so very kind to us. But people are scared. Maybe if you talk to Mr. Otis? Stein could feel another headache coming on, but he ignored it. All right. I'll find Jennifer and the others. I promise. Pauline forced herself to smile and nodded. She stepped up and took Stein's hand and squeezed it before turning and walking away. Stein realized she put something in his hand, a small note. He stepped back outside before opening it. 
It was written in Kathy's distinct script. Help us. Stein's face hardened. Are you okay? Let's get back to the bunker. I need to talk to Modus. Stein walked like a man with a purpose. As Sophia tried to keep up, Stein threaded his way past the handy box to the resort service entrance. It was the second hidden entrance to the bunker and led directly to the production floor. Placing his hand on the scanner, the light turned green and the door opened, leading past a series of rad showers and down into the bunker itself. Stein's head was beginning to pound, but he pushed the pain aside and strode into production, ignoring the bunker staff. It didn't take him long to find who he was looking for, as Captain Reynolds was standing square in the middle of the room, flanked by two guards that Stein didn't recognize. Major Stein, Otis informed us you would be returning. So glad to have you back. Cut the bullshit, Reynolds. I have no idea why Modus put you in charge, but as of right now, I'm in command. Until the Colonel returns, and I'm going to speak to Modus myself about some other unusual things going on around here. Reynolds dropped his smile, but only for a moment. Of course, Major. Did you achieve your mission? Yes. We were able to retrieve the data from the escape capsule. Excellent. Modus is also very interested in speaking with you, Major. He also requested you to bring your guest as well, since this does also concern her. I'm not sure how any of this concerns you, Captain. I expect an update on the Colonel's expedition and status as soon as I'm done with Modus. Do you understand me? Understood, Major. Stein took Sophia by the hand and led her out of production. I don't like him at all. Reynolds is as much a snake and he will shed his skin twice as fast if it means getting out of trouble. I'll talk to Modus about this and get it sorted. Then I need to find out what's going on with the Colonel. If she's in trouble, I'll take anyone I can get my hands on and get up after her. As they walked, Stein had to put his hand up to his head. The pounding in his temples was impossible to ignore despite his attempts. Worse still, he caught images out of the corner of his eyes. One was his wife Molly, another was General Santiago and he could swear that he just saw President Eckhart. Protect and serve. Andrew, are you sure you're okay? You don't look so good. Molly, I'm fine. We just need to get up and talk to Modus. Molly? Sophia. I mean, Sophia. It's just... It's just hard to concentrate. Sophia squeezed Stein's hand as they walked down the corridor to Modus's mainframe. When the door opened, Stein briefly saw flames and wrecked computer terminals, which disappeared between blinks. Major, we're so glad you've returned. Modus was worried about you. Shadow? Just what the hell are you doing here? I'm just here to help, Major. And I will be having a few words with your guest. I, I don't know about this. Like hell you will. That is... enough, Stein. Stein stopped mid-sentence, like he was frozen in place. Contact was... lost. You will... explain. I... don't understand the question. Contact was... lost. You will... explain. Modus... I... The asset requires thorough examination to identify the defect. Suspending processes. Stein folded like a ragdoll, falling to the floor. Andrew! Don't worry your pretty little head, Miss Astronaut. You'll be just fine after Motus figures out what you two are up to out there in the wastelands. Like I was saying, we have some questions for you. And we'll be taking that data recording you're carrying, too. Sophia had her hands on Stein's face, but she couldn't get a response out of him. She looked up at Shadow with hate in her eyes. If you've hurt him, I swear... Sophia grabbed Stein's sidearm, but before she could raise the pistol, Shadow had crossed the distance and knocked it out of her hand. You are a fiery one, aren't you? Commander Sophia de Guerre, we do not wish to harm you. However... You are not required to be conscious, either. What do you want from me?
Project Deep Sleep, Sophia. Dr. Emerson? I thought you'd be dead. What are you doing here? It's a long story, Sophia. Now, like Modus said, we can do this the easy way, or we can do this the hard way. It's your choice. Emerson, what did you do? I did what I had to, Commander Daguerre. I did what I had to. Sophia stood up and took a step forward to slap Emerson, but Shadow got there first. She didn't see the fist and ended up crumpled on the floor next to Stein. Was that necessary? She'll be fine. I abhor violence. <laughs> Shadow, retrieve the data recorder and take it and the subject to the Somnus Lab. Dr. Emerson, we expect your analysis to begin immediately. Follow me, Doctor. What about him? Our asset is not your concern. Of course, Modus. Stein, it is time that we talk. Serve and protect. there was a heart to the mire, Red may have truly found it. The strangler vines, a common feature along her route, now lay even more thickly on the ground, wrapped around almost every tree and made travel even more difficult. Even the creatures she spied were wrapped in red vines, almost like they were part of the living whole, and it frightened her to her core. This was no place for humanity, and no place for someone like her. So damn tired. I'd throw myself to the reavers if it meant getting out of all this. Red stumbled and had to prop herself up on an old rotted stump. Every bone in her body seemed to ache, and she was so very hungry. Since her last encounter, she'd eaten her last bit of preserved food and had been left to eat bugs and whatever small critters she could get her hands on. Probably the only two things on her that were still worth a damn were old Percy and her paw's hat. Her clothes were caked in too many layers of dirt and mud to count, and the thought of her last shower, all the way down at that place called Sugar Grove, was just a distant memory. Ma. Pa, I'm real sorry. Maybe I should have stayed and finished what I started. I guess I don't know anymore. Struggling to put one foot in front of the other, Red looked up at the thick canopy above. She hadn't seen the sun in days, and it was so damn hard to tell if it was even day or night, as the deep gloom seemed to change very little during the course of whatever day it was. The only bright spot, her only hope that drove her forward, was something she had heard a few hours before. If she was honest with herself, it was probably a figment of her damn imagination, but Red swore she heard it. A beep. Just a single beep. But it was the first time that tracker she'd been carrying around all that way from Big Ben Tunnel had made a single sound. Then he said I gotta be within a couple miles, right? Maybe it was just her mind playing tricks on her, trying to give her a reason to keep going, or just the mire fucking with her, because she'd walked in circles until her legs gave out and she didn't get another damn beat. Resting against the stump, Red tried to pull herself back together. You ain't gonna die here, Red. You just ain't. Fuck them ravers. Fuck Vinny. Fuck them all. Gritting her teeth, Red picked herself up and tried to get her bearings again. Every direction looked the same. More vines, swamp, and trees as far as the eyes could see. All right. Just find north. That ain't so hard. What was it the pappy said about moss? Always grows on the north side of trees, right? Working her way around the general area, Red kept a sharp lookout for moss. Plus, of course, anything that was going to try to eat her. It took her a while, but she finally found moss. Now it was green and glowing, but it was most certainly moss. Just to make sure, Red searched around some more, and when she was finally convinced of where she was, and more importantly, which way she needed to go, Red tightened the straps on her pack and put one foot in front of the other. Vinny, if I get out of here, 
You're gonna seriously regret putting this damn collar around this here, Nick. Fred ignored the pain, ignored her hunger, and just kept moving. It wasn't long before she heard something up ahead. Crouching behind a fallen tree, she peeked around the corner and saw one of those damn anglers. I ain't going around. That fucker can't be too tough. Not for old Percy and me. Sighting down the barrel of her rifle, Red put her sights on the creature's head. Taking a deep breath, then exhaling slowly, she pulled the trigger. The silenced weapon jumped in her hand, and the sound of the shot was lost in the din of insects and the wind. The angler flinched as the bullet lodged in its skull, and it turned in the direction of the shot, if only by instinct. Shit. Bad idea, Red. Figuring it still quite hadn't seen her, Red sighted again and fired, seemingly to only further annoy the large creature. The glowing protrusion hanging from the angler's head swayed from side to side as it picked up speed, charging in Red's direction. Well, crap. I always said never to poke the damn bear. Fuck it. Red flipped the switch on the rifle from semi-automatic to full automatic and rested the barrel on the crook in the tree to steady herself. Just as she pulled the trigger, the angler shot something from its mouth, some kind of glowing, burning mass. Red barely had time to duck as it whizzed over her head and exploded behind her. Y'all gotta be kidding me. The angler was getting too damn close and Red aimed again, pulling and holding the trigger down this time, sending the entire magazine downrange into the creature's face. It leapt at her, claws outstretched, bellowing and spewing out a burning snotball at her. Red rolled to the side, feeling something give out in her ankle, the same one she'd injured back at Sugar Grove, but it was just enough to cause the creature to miss her. Running on pure adrenaline now, Red ignored the pain and slapped a fresh magazine into old Percy and aimed at the angler as it tried to get back up. Working up from its chest to its head, the glowing ball in front of its face exploded in a spray of gore, followed by another bullet going right through its eye. Just as the bolt clicked forward, signifying no more bullets, the angler screamed one more time before keeling over into the muddy water. Fuck me. Don't you ever fucking do that again, okay, Red? She laughed at herself, <laughs> then winced as she tried to put weight on her leg. Oh, crap. Red didn't know if she broke it or if it was just a sprain, but whatever she did was bad. She couldn't let that stop her, though. Red had come too far, and if she didn't keep moving, she was nothing but food for whatever else came along. Red found a small tree branch to use as a crutch and grimaced as she poked the angler to make sure it was dead before hobbling back towards the north. She figured out just how much weight she could put on her damn leg, and while it wasn't much, it was better than nothing. The gloom around her deepened, and that creeping doubt seeped back in. Stow that shit, Red. You ain't dead yet. Huh? Can't be, can it? Well, I'll be dipped in shit. Red pulled the tracker from her pocket and held it out in front of her. Sure enough, she could see a faint glow and hear a soft beep. She waved the tracker around and was rewarded with a slightly louder beep when it pointed north. <laughs> if she didn't laugh, Red would have cried. There were parts of her that never believed she'd find anything other than the end of a gun, tooth or claw. But this was real. Fuck you, Vinny. You ain't gonna beat Red. Realizing she'd been louder than intended, Red dropped and looked around but was merely greeted by the sounds of the mire around her. So she reloaded her rifle, put the tracker out in front of her, and started walking again, careful not to injure her leg further. As the beeps got louder, Red felt more alive with every step. Perhaps there was a future for her after all. Close by, another set of eyes watched Red through a pair of binoculars. A smile crept across the figure's face. Soon they would have exactly what they needed, and they would change the world. Hi, I'm Fire Rider, and I'm the host of The Pixel People, a podcast dedicated to taking a close look at our favorite characters from our favorite video games. From major characters who define the course of a game's storyline, to smaller characters who you might have never noticed. Every week, we go beyond the quest line to examine a particular character's story arc and choices, and discover the real-world parallels and life lessons hidden just below the surface. I hope you'll join us. You can find the Pixel People on Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and everywhere else you listen to podcasts. It 
stay in the Overseer led a small group of 76ers and Foundation folks down the hill from the Red Rocket Megastop, where they had made their camp for the night before. The trip north had taken longer than expected, as they went out of their way to avoid Morgantown and the new Enclave patrols in the area. Along the way, the group had heard rumors of strange going-ons down south, something about supermutants, but nothing concrete. Their current mission was far too important to pay mind to the rumors, and whatever it was could be dealt with later. As they crested the hill, they caught sight of their destination. Freddy Fears, House of Scares. My parents used to take me there as a child, eh? It was the best place in all of Appalachia to get your Halloween costume. I even managed to convince Voltec to buy a whole load of them for the vault. Seems like Appalachia is already scary enough, Overseer. Oh, day. Once we start rebuilding again, I'll show you just how amazing these old holidays can be. <laughs> Whatever you say, Overseer. The group were rendezvousing with the rest of the Vault 79 raid team. They had left a couple of days before them from Foundation and included Dr. Penny Hornreich, Paige, a group of U.S. military soldiers, and Jen the Scavenger. Each of them had a vital role to play in bypassing the various security measures inside the vault, while Paige would help coordinate the inventory and collection of the gold. Of course, it was Dr. Hornreich herself who would get them into the vault, using one of her father's inventions. The mother load, an enormous drill and ore collector which was supposed to revolutionize mining as they knew it, was the key to the project. Day had discovered Dr. Hornwright in the basement safe room of her family's mansion. She had been forced to flee Appalachia after becoming a ghoul, leaving behind the rest of her family who would take shelter in a vault. It was her knowledge of the mother load which allowed them to reprogram the giant machine to tunnel right up to Vault 79 and break into the lower levels, allowing them access. Based on surveys of the area, the good doctor had identified Freddy's Fear House of Scares as the best location to start digging. Outside of the old costume store, Day was surprised to find a functioning iBot. To get a load of this? Huh. Well, I recognize most of that from old radio shows from back in the day. Sounds like someone had fun reprogramming this little guy. I'll never understand what people did before the war. A harmless prank by the sounds of it, Day. Let's just get inside before anyone else decides to stop by. We're late, anyway. Day turned and walked towards the back of the building while the overseer just smiled and gave the iBot a pat on the head. You just keep doing what you're doing, little one. Day led them all to the cellar entrance, walking down a set of stairs into their makeshift expedition command center. Dr. Hornwright was bent over a terminal, inputting the final set of instructions while Paige was on the radio. Ward, come in. Ward, are you reading us? Paige, is there a problem? Strangest thing. I can't get anyone at Foundation. Could be a problem with their transmitter, maybe. Maybe. I don't like it. We need to get a move on and get back as soon as possible. We're almost there, Paige. This will change everything. Foundation will be the start of something brand new. Paige nodded, but his face betrayed his concern. He put the lives of his people above all else. It was the one overriding concern of his since the very beginning, when he first led the survivors out of the Capital Wasteland. Are you sure everything is okay, Day? It will all be fine, Overseer. This is our chance of getting out from under the White Spring. And Cindy? I left instructions. When this is all over, she may have some hurt feelings. I'll talk to her. Apologize. I'm sure she'll understand. Day just smiled and went over to check on the rest of the team. Well, it was quite the ragtag group. Each and every individual had been chosen for their unique skills and knowledge to make this mission a success. For too long, Day had been forced to watch the influence of the White Spring grow. To him, they were no better than raiders, and in many ways, they were far, far worse. His fathers made sure that he had a firm understanding of the values the country had been founded on, not the false ones pushed by the corporations and the government before the war. Valeria and her ilk represented a continuation of those false ideals, and as much as the raiders represented the kill-or-be-killed attitude perpetuated by society even before the war, actions taken in boardrooms in Congress, and now at the point of the gun in the wasteland, Vault 79 would change everything. This is all very strange. Dr. Hornwright was typing furiously on her keyboard, working out the final details of the Motherlode's programming. Problems, Doctor? I've been cross-referencing the Motherlode's old files to get a better sense of the underground topography. She wasn't just sitting around all these years after the war. 
and there is a lot of data here about her travels. I never bothered to check before because it wasn't relevant. And? Tatters. Lots of tatters. At least I think that's what they are. There is too much here for me to analyze right now. Mother Lode seems to have avoided them for the most part. Not sure why exactly. Doesn't sound like anything we need to worry about right now, though. Of course. My apologies. It's this old curious brain of mine. Always looking for mysteries to solve. I'll download this data. I want to dive into this when we get back to Foundation. There are some anomalous signals in here too, and they look awfully familiar. Well, Doctor, is everything else set? One more line of code. Done. Just give the word, and Mother Lode will be on her way. All right. First, I want to thank you all for being a part of this momentous occasion. None of this would have been possible without the help of Paige and his friends. You are all part of our family now. The one that started with Vault 76, but now represents the best and the brightest of us all. Starting today, together, we'll create a better future. Everyone knows the plan. The Mother Lord will dig from underneath this building all the way up to Vault 79. Paige will blow a hole down to the tunnel and the rest of us will follow the path created for us. We have a rough idea of where we'll emerge in the vault, and then we deal with the defenses. Jen will neutralize the laser grids with her Chinese stealth suit, while Sergeant Radcliffe will take care of the laser turrets. The rest of us will take care of any bots we find, if any are hostile. Any last questions? Day looked around the room. They had been planning this operation for months, and everyone knew their assignments. It wasn't going to be a walk in the park. The government had spared no expense in designing the defenses of the vault, but Dave was confident that they could handle whatever they found. All right then, Dr. Hornwright, let's go. Dr. Hornwright adjusted her glasses before hitting the execute command. The entire building started to shake as the enormous drilling machine came to life below them, biting into the rock and lurching forward. The vibrations increased and Day looked nervously at the ceiling, as did just about everyone else, except Dr. Hornrick, who was merely beaming with pride. It was a testament to her father that his invention was helping them all these years later. After a minute, the vibrations eased as the machine dug its way north. Dr. Hornrick would continue to monitor its progress, while the others took the opportunity to check their weapons one more time. About an hour later, the doctor received new data from the mother load. She's reached the vault. Hmm. The walls are thicker than we thought. Can it still breach? She can, but I need to override the safety protocols. There is a good chance she'll burn out. Do it, Doctor. I'd hate to lose her. Almost feels like she's all the family I have left. I understand, but if we don't get into the vault, everything we've done will be for nothing. Dr. Hornwright frowned, but went back to the keyboard and activated the override protocols. The mother load backed up before revving its engines again, pushing forward with renewed speed. It smashed into the steel reinforced concrete, drills spinning wildly until they finally achieved purchase, digging into the vault. The extra power started burning out vital systems, but with one final surge of effort, the wall finally collapsed and the mother load opened a large hole into Vault 79. She did it. We're in. Great job, Doctor! Oh no. I don't think she'll move again, though. Old girl, I'm sorry. It's okay. We'll see if we can recover her once we're finished, yeah? Dr. Hornwright gave Day a sad little smile before going back to finish downloading all of the archive data. Even if the mother load was gone, there were still further mysteries to investigate. Okay, Paige, it's your turn. Everyone upstairs, people. The combined team retreated upstairs as Paige wired the last of the charges. It wasn't going to be a big explosion, but he was not going to take any chances with people's lives. He returned upstairs with the rest, holding the detonator in his hand. Paige pressed the button, and there was a hollow boom from below, followed by the sound of rocky debris falling. Waiting a few minutes for everything to settle, they all went downstairs and had to admire Paige's work. Their rear wall had been blown out in almost a perfect circle, leading down to the tunnel created by the mother load. Day shone his flashlight and illuminated the tunnel. It looked stable enough, and the faint glow of light was lost in the gloom as the trail led north to their final destination. 
Paige, Dr. Hornwright, we'll stay in contact via the radio. Everyone else, let's go! Ropes were quickly tied, allowing each member of the team to climb down. Day helped the overseer, who at first squatted away his hand. I may not be the spring chicken I used to be, but I can still climb a rope, Day. And my father's taught me to help and respect my elders, overseer. The overseer made a grumpy face, but finally let Day help her down the rope and onto the freshly dug tunnel floor. Paige looked into the hole and watched as the group, illuminated by their flashlights, started walking north, until he finally lost them in the darkness. He said a silent prayer and hoped that all the months of work would be worth it. Until they heard back, he had other things to worry about. Dr. Hornwright, can you help me with the radio? I'm still worried we can't raise foundation. I need to know what's going on. Emmett Mountain was now the center of the maelstrom. Explosions from rockets rocked the ground while miniguns chewed away at concrete barricades. Bodies of super mutants lay scattered around the perimeter alongside those of their hounds, but for every mutant killed, more appeared to take their place. For the defenders of Emmett Mountain, the celebrations of their initial victory against the super mutants was short-lived. Far from being defeated, the mutant leaders changed their tactics, using their long-range weapons to harass the humans and target their heavier weapons. Further attacks all along the perimeter threatened to overwhelm the defenses, and they were holding on by the skin of their teeth. The one glimmer of hope was a fragment of a radio message they had received two hours before. It had been garbled, nearly unintelligible, but it had come in on the new Enclave command frequency. Polly was sure it was close, close enough to break through whatever communications blackout they were under. For Jones, that had been enough. The Colonel was coming, and they just needed to hold out a while longer. While rockets continued to rain in from the surrounding hills, Jones sprinted from cover to cover, heading to the makeshift medical bunk to check on one very important person. He dodged another incoming rocket before reaching his destination, opening the door and slipping inside. Eugenie! Eugenie! The bunker had once been Marion Copeland's personal office space and supply room. After too many close calls outside, Jones had gotten Marion to allow them to move all the wounded into the bunker, and honestly, Jones felt a lot better with Eugenie having a concrete ceiling over her head. He found the ghoul sitting next to an occupied cot. Gonna be okay. You're gonna see your mama real soon. I promise. Jones walked over and saw who Eugenie was talking to. It was one of the young caravan guards. He had been badly wounded and Jones could see that he had been crying. Eugenie put her hand on the young man's head and wiped his eyes. Then she brushed them closed. Every one of them is too many. Damn it all. Eugenie. You doing okay? The ghoul stood up and wiped her own eyes before turning to Jones. I've seen so much death, but you never get used to it. I know you're doing all you can. It's all any of us can do. That still don't make it right, Jones. You got me cooped up in here while these folks are dying out there. That ain't right at all. Eugenie, if anything happened to you... I ain't your prisoner, Jones. I ran once, because I had to. But I made a promise that I was done running. These folks need tending, but I can hold my own in a fight. Don't you ever forget that. Jones could see the fire in the ghoul's eyes, and he believed her. I won't, Eugenie. Now, I need more medical supplies. Just about out of stim packs here, and I just gave our last dose of medics. You've got all we could find. i scraping the bottom of the barrel here. Shit! How much longer we gotta hold? The Colonel is coming. I think she's close. Real close. If anyone can make it, Val can. All right, Jones, I'm sorry I snapped at you. You gotta keep these folks safe if only for a while longer. I'll tend to the ones here. It's all I ask. And I'll see if we can find any other supplies, okay? Eugenie gave Jones a smile and turned to take care of her other patients. Looking around the room, Jones could see far too many, and that didn't even count the ones who didn't make it. As much as he believed the Colonel would be there any minute, he knew how desperate the situation really was. Jones walked back out and kept one eye on the sky. The barrage of rockets seemed to have eased up, which probably meant another attack was imminent. Spying Tyson working on their sole remaining 50 cal, Jones ran over to check on the sergeant. Sergeant, figure they're about to hit us. Wager you're right, LT. 50 jammed again. Ammo we got ain't worth shit. 
Been sitting in storage for a couple of decades by the looks of it. We're spread real thin. I think we need to pull back to the interior line. Tyson pried a bent casing out of the heavy machine gun's receiver and tossed it onto the ground, then rechecked the firing mechanism, pulling the bolt back and letting it slam forward. We're back in business. Yeah. Just like Anchorage. LT, them commies kept coming too. I swear we'd run out of bullets before they ran out of bodies. The old sergeant had this faraway look in his eyes, like he was still there in the Anchorage trenches. Yeah, LT, we gotta pull back. Don't know if we can sucker him twice with this one, but we gotta try. Though, I don't want to be the one to tell Graham we're pulling back. He's on a tear, I tell you. I'll tell him. But I swear, if you told me I'd be giving orders to a super mutant, I'd think you were crazy. LT, if this all ain't crazy, I don't know what is. The volume of fire picked up as more super mutants emerged from the tree lines, firing as they came. Jones ran to the north wall, ducking as he went, bullets whizzing over his head. Corporal Samantha, her face covered in dirt and mud, kept her rifle aimed at the tree line, firing short controlled bursts that the mutants emerged there. She heard the LT slide in next to her, but beyond a slight nod, she didn't move. Corporal, we're gonna pull back. As soon as I give the command, get everyone back to the interior barricades. Got it? You're the boss, Lieutenant. Jones kept moving, letting Samuel know, then Marion. Neither was happy about it, but they didn't have a choice. Then Jones heard a super mutant roar and looked up to see Graham swinging his tenderizer again, smashing down a charging mutant, crushing its skull with a single blow. Graham! Graham! Be busy, human! We're pulling back! We want to stay! Protect more humans! You can protect us back there, okay? Ugh, me no like, but me listen to Jones. Just then, a mutant hound jumped over the wall. Graham caught the beast mid-flight, knocking it aside before smashing it with a huge overhead strike. Like I said, I am glad he's on our side. The super mutants probably knew it was only a matter of time. Sure, the puny humans had put up more than a fight than expected, but that wasn't going to matter in the end. The others were close, very close. It was time to end this. With a roar, the super mutants charged forward en masse. This was the signal for Jones. He gave a sharp whistle when the defenders fired, emptied their magazines, or tossing grenades and improvised explosives to cover themselves as they pulled back. Using whatever scrap was available, a number of the civilians had erected a ring of barricades around the inner courtyard. It wasn't much, but better than nothing, and it would give the defenders a final fallback position, covering the medical bunker and the entrance to the disposal site, where the non-combatants and children were being sheltered. Jones was running alongside Corporal Samantha when she was hit in the leg by a straight bullet. She grunted and almost fell, but Jones grabbed her arm and kept them moving until they were behind cover. Tyson watched the first mutants breach the walls. He took aim down the barrel of the 50 cal and depressed the trigger, smiling as the large caliber rounds took off arms, legs, and heads, the super mutant blood spraying into the air. Jones grabbed his medkit and helped the corporal. It isn't that bad, Lieutenant. I can still fight. Let me at least put a bandage on it. Pressing a wad of gauze against the wound, Jones then wrapped the bandage around the corporal's leg several times before tying it off. It wasn't pretty in Samantha Winston pain, but she was back in the fight, joining the rest firing at the advancing mutants. The ground was covered in spent shell casings and empty magazines, yet the super mutants kept coming. Another wave of them came over the wall, and Tyson turned the heavy machine gun, only to have the weapon jam yet again. Damn it! The sergeant did his best to clear the bent cartridge from the belt, and Jones watched in horror as a group of super mutants went straight for the medical bunker. Left! Fire left! Their fire shifted and three of the mutants fell under their guns, but the other two, laughing the whole way, crashed through the door of the medical bunker. Jones went white, because it was no guards, and no one else in there but Eugenie. No, no, no! Jones slapped a fresh magazine into his rifle and ran towards the bunker, all the while screams and gunfire echoed from inside. Fearing the worst, he slid through the doorway, pointing his rifle around the room. Through the haze of cordite, Jones could see multiple dead bodies, including two very dead super mutants. Eugenie! A lone figure emerged from behind a desk. It was Eugenie carrying her trusty 44. With a casual flip of her wrist, she emptied the spent casings, reloading each cylinder. A little warning would have been nice. How did you? They may be smart. But a bullet to the brain still puts them down just fine. The ghoul's satisfaction was short-lived as she saw that in the fight, brief as it had been, all of her patients had been killed. The loss hit her all at once and she choked back tears, her face a mix of grief and anger. Jeannie, we need to get out of here. It's not safe. 
Eugenie tried to pull herself back together, and Jones grabbed her by the arm, pulling her towards the door. The firing outside reached a new crescendo as Tyson was able to get the 50 cal back into the fight. Once outside, the two found shelter behind one of the barricades. Eugenie took aim with her pistol, downing another mutant. The La Suicider exploded nearby, tearing a hole in their line, killing several defenders. Samuel led an attempt to close the gap, but Jones watched him fall as he was shot multiple times. Graham ran forward with his tenderizer, swinging it from left to right, taking fire from his erstwhile brothers, shrugging off wounds until Tyson was able to clear the area with the 50 cal, but it had used up nearly all of their remaining heavy machine gun ammunition. It was a brief lull as Jones counted their losses. Besides Samuel, they had another half dozen dead and more wounded. Eugenie did her best as those who couldn't walk were pulled back towards the entrance to the disposal site. Jones, my crew is spent. We ain't got much left. Just a little longer. The Colonel will be here. Bullshit. There isn't gonna be anyone left here to rescue. Don't stay with humans. No humans, no trade. And I don't leave Charlie either. Jones could see all eyes on him, each man and woman looking for guidance, looking for leadership. He was brought back to that day in the bog, when they faced down another horde of monsters. No matter what happens, our job is to protect the civilians. Not a single one of those things is going to get past us. Do you understand? Jones could see the fear in their eyes, and remembered his own. Appalachia is our home, not theirs. We fight for what is ours. We fight to save as many lives as we can. And we fight because it's the right thing to do. Are you with me? I got nowhere else to be today, Guilty. We save humans for trade! Well, shit. I said no fucking monsters were gonna take my claim, and I ain't no liar. Eugenie finished reloading a revolver and nodded at Jones. Whatever happened, they do it together. Live or die trying. The howl of the mutant hound singled another attack, followed by a rain of rockets which exploded over the disposal site. Dozens of super mutants charged forward again, flanked by suiciders and more hounds. Tyson jumped on the 50 cal and started using it as a sniper rifle, firing short bursts to blow up the suiciders far enough away to prevent more damage. Miniguns opened up, tearing through barricades and killing more of the defenders, while Jones and the others did their best they could to return fire. They were pressed backwards until the survivors were arrayed around the entrance to the underground disposal site. The women and children huddled there, looked up and could hear the explosions and gunfire getting closer and closer. Above ground, the site was swarming with super mutants, all intent on ending this fight once and for all. The overlords expected to feed well that night. Jones knew they were running low on ammunition. Tyson had given up on the 50 cal and had picked up his rifle. Samantha had taken another bullet to the shoulder, but she was still in the fight. The rest of Marion's scavenger crew fought like demons, hurling improvised explosives or rolling barrels of toxic waste towards the advancing super mutants before lighting them on fire or blowing them up. Graham kept swinging his tenderizer, taking down mutant after mutant, doing his best to protect the humans. But Jones was losing hope. He wondered if anyone would remember them or even care, and he wondered where the colonel was. The ripping sound of a Goss minigun broke through the cacophony of violence, tearing huge holes in the super mutant ranks. This was followed by the pounding feet of power armor and the plasma fire directed at the attackers. The colonel is here! The defenders cheered as a half dozen suits of new enclave power armor marched through the front gate, firing at every super mutant they could see. Following behind were the other new enclave soldiers spreading out to take advantageous firing position. Jones recognized two of them. There was Bitter and Sullivan working together as a team, tossing grenades and firing from the hip as they moved from wreck barricade to bunker, helping clear the disposal site. And in the front, Wearing her black painted power armor, the colonel advanced through the fire, using the Goss minigun to blast a corridor for her troops to move forward, driving the super mutants back. One mutant charged her from the side, raising its super sledge to bring it down on her head. She caught the sledge in her powered gauntlet and swiveled the minigun, blasting the super mutant to a fine pace. That's my vow. Jones and the others watched as the new enclave relief force waded into the fight, no quarter asked and none given. It wasn't easy, and the super mutants never broke, never ran. It seemed to take forever for the last of them to be killed, still facing the humans until the last. When it was over, the colonel stood in the center of the disposal site, surrounded by dead super mutants. She hit the quick release on the power arm as she stepped foot on the broken earth. Valeria spotted Eugenie standing on top of the final barricade. She didn't bother to hide the smile on her face, nor did she care what anyone thought as Eugenie ran to her, jumping into her arms and kissing her. Breaking the kiss, Eugenie looked at Val. I knew you'd make it. I was so scared, Jeannie. I thought I was going to lose you. I ain't that easy to kill, you know. 
And anyways, you promised to make me dinner. I wasn't going to let you break that promise. Valeria smiled and kissed Eugenie again. There was a cough behind them and they turned, arm in arm with each other. Ma'am, it's damn good to see you. Lieutenant, I'm sorry we were late. You made it. That's what counts, Colonel. By the looks of it, we were almost too late. We lost a lot of good people. The civilians are safe, and I know they'd love to get some fresh air. They'll need a place to go. I've been giving that a lot of thought, Lieutenant, since we left. I think it's time we open up the White Spring a bit more. It's not just more mouths to feed. I can see that now. It's about providing safety and security, and a place to call home. My vow. That's mighty kind of you. Sure is, ma'am. Let's tend to the wounded and bury the dead. I don't think this is over just because we gave these super mutants a black eye. Marion Copeland, sporting a bandaged arm and one pissed off attitude, came marching over. So, you're the colonel, huh? Just look at what y'all did to my claim. Lost most of my crew, supplies, and the facility is a shambles. I'll never be able to break a profit now. Jones was about to intervene when Valeria put up her hand. Miss Copeland, I understand and sympathize with your losses. You sympathize? You can take your sympathy and shove it up your ass. However, despite how you might feel about your losses, you are alive. And we can offer something in return. Our mission is to rebuild, and there is quite a bit of salvage here that we need. We can offer you a variety of bots to help out around here as you rebuild. In return, we'd like to come to an arrangement for access to your salvage. And we'll pay. Bots and caps? Well, that's a whole different story. Maybe you ain't just stuffed shirts after all. Now, why why don't you let me negotiate the terms with Mary in here? I can guarantee you won't be disappointed. Valeria smiled, but blushed a little, realizing how open she'd been in public. That would be... satisfactory, Eugenie. Lieutenant? Yes, ma'am? Would you care to explain what a live super mutant is doing here? And why is he talking to Sergeant Tyson? That's Graham, ma'am. It's hard to believe, but he's friendly. Save the sergeant, Samantha, and I. He's been fighting by our side the whole time. Really? Hey, Graham! Come on over! I want to introduce you to someone. The big super mutant looked over and waved. The colonel was surprised when he reached down and shook Tyson's hand, then walked over to stand in front of her. Colonel, I'd like to introduce you to Graham. Graham, this is Colonel Valeria. Uh, uh, yo? Uh, That sounds nice. Me, Graham. Always looking for stuff to trade. Happy to save humans. Mean more people to trade with. Graham, it's a pleasure to meet you. And thank you. Ha ha ha! Me welcome! Me need feed Charlie now, but maybe trade later? Valeria was very bemused. Of all the things she had seen in Appalachia, this was certainly one of the strangest. Thanks again, Graham. The super mutant walked away and over to a Brahmin that was lazily eating some of the remaining grass. Eugenie, I know you've been through hell already, but could you help get the civilians organized? I don't want to stay here any longer than necessary, and we need to head back to the White Spring. Sure thing, Val. Eugenie gave Valeria another peck on the cheek and went over to talk to the civilians. As Valeria surveyed the landscape, Bitter and Sullivan came over. Colonel, we spotted super mutants gathering again at the top of the ridge. Now, they ain't moving towards us yet, but I figure it's only a matter of time. Yeah, looks like at least two or three separate groups might be waiting on something. I can't tell from here. All right. Tell Team Beta to keep watch. I do not want to be surprised, nor do I want to get into another fight before we can get the civilians on the road. Find Captain Robertson and get him over here. I need an update on our communications. Yes, ma'am. The two operatives headed in opposite directions, while Jones watched as the rest of the teams continued their work. Colonel. What is it, Jones? You were having communication problems, too? The colonel took off her sunglasses. The silver eye shone in the afternoon light, while the other looked worried. We lost contact with the bunker and Modus several hours ago. We tried relaying messages, but it didn't work. It's like something is blocking our signals. That's why we don't have Kovac support either. What's going on, Colonel? I just don't know, Lieutenant. 
These super mutants... This isn't normal. Or as normal as things can be in Appalachia these days. They harassed us most of the way up the road, but they seemed to fall apart just before we got here. Valeria looked back to the road, then over to Jones. They wanted us to get here. Valeria's train of thought was interrupted by Captain Robertson's arrival. Ma'am, you wanted to see me? Captain, we need to get the civilians moving as quickly as possible. Get the wounded on their feet as best you can and tell Beta they'll be running escort duty. The rest of us will follow. We will rendezvous at Middle Mountain Cabins. Yes, ma'am. The captain saluted and left to fulfill the colonel's orders. You were saying, ma'am, they wanted you here? I don't like this, Lieutenant. I've missed something. We need to move. Colonel, mutants coming. Damn. Jones, I want you to stay with the civilians. Take the corporal as well. I know she's wounded and you both have done more than enough. But ma'am... We'll take it from here, Lieutenant. And we will be right behind you. Be careful, Colonel. Don't underestimate them. Valeria smiled, then saluted. Jones went to help get the civilians herded towards the gate, helped by the sounds of gunfire to the north. None of them wanted to get caught in another battle, and Team Beta had their hands full, preventing a full stampede. The Colonel walked towards their power armor when Mary and Copeland came running up. Miss Copeland, I suggest you join the civilians. I intend to fully honor my promise, but first we have to deal with these super mutants. I ain't running, Colonel. And I plan on sticking to you like glue until you make this right for me and my crew. All right, Miss Copeland. Just keep out of our firing lanes and try not to get killed. Marion smirked and slapped a fresh magazine into her rifle before joining the remains of her crew. Valeria stepped into her power armor, getting her bearings again. I hate it when Lilith is right. This does chafe like no one's business. Valeria reached down to pick up her helmet, lifting up her head to find Eugenie standing in front of her. You're not leaving, Val? Eugenie, we have to cover the civilians. I need you to be with them. Help them get down the mountain to safety. I'd rather stay with you. I... I'll see you at the cabins. And I promise you'll have that dinner, okay? Eugenie looked at Valeria, a tear welling up in the corner of her eye. She took a step forward and threw her arms around the power armor, squeezing as hard as she could. Don't you dare die on me, Val. I love you. I love you too, Jeannie. As the gunfire increased on the perimeter, Eugenie took a step back and wiped her eyes. Valeria put on her helmet, picked up the Goss minigun, and stomped off to join the rest of the new Enclave soldiers. Eugenie watched her go and truly wondered if she'd ever see her again. Eugenie, we need to go. I know, I know. The two jogged to meet up with the rear of the column of civilians, guarded by Team Beta. While it wasn't exactly an orderly procession, they were all going in the same direction, and soon the sound of gunfire receded into the distance. Back at the remains of Emmett Mountain, teams Omicron and Theta were engaged in a long-range gunnery duel with the Super Mutants. Few rockets were fired this time, perhaps a sign that the Super Mutants were running low. Where they got so many in the first place was a question yet to be answered. The colonel walked over and around the countless dead super mutant bodies and found herself on the north wall, next to Bitter and Sullivan. <clears throat> Status? Pissed off, colonel. I don't think that's what she meant, Sullivan. How do you know? Stow it, Sullivan. What are the mutants doing? Wish I knew. They sent a dozen or so down the ridge, but the rest are just sitting up there. It doesn't feel right. Well, if they want to take it easy, that's fine. We just need to buy enough time for the civilians to get down the mountain. Robertson? Yes, Colonel. What's your status? Killed a couple suiciders, but the rest seem to be hanging back. Good. Report any other activity, but be careful. Guess we aren't gonna see any more action today. Wanna put caps on that, Sullivan? Sure. Why not? Fifty. No, make that a hundred. Ah, that's a sucker bet. You're on. I'll never understand either of you. For the next few minutes, Valeria continued to scan the tree lines and had a few stray bullets bounce off her armor. Reports from the other teams were the same. No real movement from the super mutants, just dulcetory long-range fire. All right, teams. This is the colonel. Be prepared to move out in ten minutes. Looks like the mutants aren't coming out to play. Theta will move first, followed by Omicron, then Alpha. But be ready for anything. They have a move left they haven't made yet. Valeria received acknowledgments from the team leaders. She still had that odd feeling, that itch between her shoulder blades. But if the super mutants didn't want another fight, she didn't feel the need to force one. Hey, do you feel that? Feel what? Earthquake? Shit. I do feel something. What are you two talking about? The Earth is moving. The stabilizers in the Colonel's power armor must have dampened the effect, 
but after a few more seconds, even she could feel it. The ground was vibrating, and the rhythm was getting stronger. Colonel, we've got movement, and a lot of it. Valeria turned to look, and she could see the trees were swaying like they were caught in a heavy wind. Except there was no wind. The ground itself was shaking, knocking bits of rubble off the walls, and now they could hear it. It was now a steady thumping sound, like a whole herd of elephants or a freight train was coming towards them. All teams, prepare for contact. All along the line, the new Enclave soldiers lifted their weapons and prepared to fire. The colonel raised her Goss minigun and aimed it towards the tree line. The trees themselves seemed to explode, some ripped bodily out of the ground. Valeria couldn't even begin to comprehend what she was seeing. Super mutants, but not super mutants. These were huge beasts, 20 to 30 feet tall, at least a dozen of them. Some wielding trees as giant clubs or massive steel beams ripped from old buildings. A collective roar rose above as they charged forward, followed by another horde of regular super mutants, seemingly tiny in comparison, but still as large or larger than even the new Enclave suits of power armor. Valeria's mouth went dry and the color drained from her face. And I looked, and beheld a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. Thank you again, members, for joining us here on The Modus Files. If you've enjoyed this content, please subscribe, and better yet, please leave a review to help others find our little enclave. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Modus Files, for more information about our podcast, Fallout 76 content, and random musings on the enclave. I'd also like to thank our cast, Pandora Beatrix as Colonel Valeria Faustina, Lucy Middleton as Major Lola Valister and Amanda, XO one King as Major Andrew Stein, Maria Cheshire as Lieutenant Cindy Connors, Chrissy Williams as Trader Red, Austin Rogers as Lieutenant Jones, Jessica Starr as Commander Sophia Daguerre, Mandy Marie B. as Duplica, Fire Rider as Eugenie, Chris Smith from One Wall Comedy as Graham, Dr. William Emerson, Malgus, The Foundation Trader, Sergeant Long, Gray Two and Three, and The Super Mutants, Wendy Novosensky as The Overseer, Ryan Nagrin as Day, Tim Young as Sullivan, Mark Hoshworth as Bitter and Ward, Monty Wildhorn as Sergeant Tyson, Vitriol Play as Pauline the Teacher, Kristen Harrison as Mar Marion Copeland and Dr. Penelope Hornwright, Casual in a Corset as Corporal Samantha, Eric Gold as Gray 15, Tom Houston as Gray 1, Patrick Conway as Captain Robertson, Daniel Hawthorne as Lieutenant Shadow, Rob Cunningham as Samuel, Lane McNulty as Polly, John Owen Sr. as Paige, and Brad Williams as the voice of Modus and Captain Reynolds. As we near the end of our second season, we wanted to give a huge shout out and thank you to the entire Fallout community. Without the support of our fellow creators, voice actors, artists, streamers, and all the fans, none of this would have been possible. Stay tuned for our season two finale, All That Glitters. Lastly, thank you to all of our subscribers and supporters. God bless the Enclave and God bless America. Members, we look forward to your next visit to our little enclave.